Now in this lecture, we will focus primarily on the moment frame resistance systems and there are two distinct type of moment frame resistance systems. One is known as um, ordinary moment frame resistant, moment resistant frame. And the other one is known as uh, special moment resistant frame. There is also another variety which is prevalent in American course, which is known as intermediate uh, moment resistant frames. But that is not mentioned in the Indian course, so I will not talk about it that here. So how does the moment frame, moment resistant frame typically works? Works if we have this frame <coughs> and we have these two forces P1 and P2 acting on this frame. This frame, this frame would want to deflect laterally, and in the process it will develop a bending moment diagram like this. And any of you who have taken analysis, basic structural analysis, would know that this is how the bending moment diagram could be. There will there will be points of inflection in each member here, and so basically, essentially, each member would be under a uh, double curvature kind of a scenario. Now, since we are interested primarily in connections, so if we look at the connections here, these connections will be subjected to bending moments in this manner. Uh, there will be bending moments coming from the columns, which are both, for example, if this uh, member is sh uh, shifting right ways towards right, uh, both these moments will be in the clockwise direction and the moments that are coming from the beams, in this case there is only one beam, there could also be another beam and if there are two beams, both moments will be in the anti-clockwise directions and they will balance each other. In addition to that, there will be large shear force demands uh, on this one, so there will be shear forces coming from the connection, uh, from the columns and there will be shear forces coming from the, uh, which is marked as VB here, shear forces coming from the beam and these all these forces along with the axial forces if there are any, they will be in equilibrium and they will be introducing different types of bending moment shear force demands on the connection. And the connection needs to be designed for these forces. So as I was talking about an ordinary moment resisting frame versus a special moment resisting frame. So an ordinary moment resisting frame is basically a less ductile type of a uh, rigid connection. It's also a rigid connection. Sometimes uh, even semi-rigid connections are also permitted or also can also be considered as an ordinary moment resistant frame member or element, but uh, special moment resistant frames have to be rigid connections only. The requirement for ordinary moment resistant frame is that it should be able to, a connection that is a part of ordinary, ordinary moment resistant frame, the connection or the joint should be, should have the capacity to at least uh, resist or to at least accommodate a 0 0.02 radian rotation without any loss in strength. What do we mean by this much of rotation? Basically, if we can think of a column like this and a beam which is connected to this column digitally like so. And if we, let's say, have these columns in fixed fixed position and the columns are very rigid, they don't move and the beam moves, the beam should be able to move by an angle which is 0.02%, sorry, 0.02 radians. So this uh, column would be undergoing a kind of a elastic deformation or plastic deformation of 2% which is basically 2% of the storage rate. So 2% uh, of the storage height. So that is the level of plastic deformation or overall deformation it should be able to accommodate. There is a, for a spatial moment frame however, this requirement is more stringent and it requires at least a 4% or 0 0.04 radians of uh, relative rotation between the beam and the column uh, without any loss in strength. So that is a very critical aspect. Now how do we know which connection is eligible or which connection is capable of undergoing this kind of a deformation without any loss in strength? For that we can use, uh, we can go to IS800, there is an extra F which uh, is taken from Bjorn uh, research wherein they have developed uh, some nice uh, connection, uh, these curves which uh, relate the rotation with moment and then there is a limit that is set according to this equation. So for various types of connections, these equations have been developed and we can actually uh, fit our connections. We, depending on all the parameters that the connection has, we can actually find the, the values and then we can find out what is the rotation capacity of my connection. And uh, that should at least satisfy the 2% or uh, 2 radians or 0 0.02 radians or 0 0.04 radians requirement. Also for such uh, connections, IS 800 specifies that only E250 B grade of steel can be used in the entire frame. 
in a special moment frame since we require a larger uh, level of ductility and also since we want these frame members to behave uh, as if they are uh, to behave as a ductility or a deformation control member we don't want them to have very high over strength so therefore uh, it is uh, it is required that these members should not be of a greater grade than e to the however in the revised code now there is uh, an allowance to use even higher grade steel that is even 350 and so on can be used but they should still be having a certain amount of high toughness so high toughness requirement is not relaxed but the strength can be higher and accordingly the other neighboring members can be designed ordinary uh, moment resisting frames both the ordinary moment resisting frame and the special moment resisting frame uh, have certain restrictions one is that only high strength friction grip bolts can be used in both of them because they are subjected to cyclic loading conditions and when we were discussing the voltage connections we did mention that whenever there is a possibility of a cyclic loading <coughs> uh, only high strength friction grip bolts should be used that is mentioned in IS 800 also the same code mentions that in the uh, locations where there is supposed to be a butt weld subjected to critical loading conditions only complete joint penetration weld should be provided that too the weld electrode should be of high toughness and the welding procedure that is followed should also lead to a high toughness uh, welding <coughs> uh, in certain cases where uh, the groove welding is provided in a column splice it may not be required to go for a uh, cjp complete joint penetration type of weld uh, especially when in the situations where the column is primarily going to remain in compression as we have discussed before the ordinary moment frame um, offers less level of ductility in comparison to the special moment frame and therefore the requirements in the special moment frame are more stringent for example <coughs> ordinary moment frames can be used only in uh, for resisting earthquake loads only in earthquake zone 2 right? so that that is the zone which has the least earthquake risk in India and IS 800 mentions that uh, OMFs can be used in zone 3 buildings also as long as the buildings have an importance factor of less than or equal to 1 that is not very critical buildings for all other buildings that is in zone 3 all the buildings of importance factor greater than 1 or in zone 4 and 5 we should always only use uh, the SMF <coughs> Um, IS 1893 part 1 again uh, differs slightly uh, with IS 800. Uh, the IS 1893 says that OMFs can be used only in zone 2. So they don't allow, the IS 1893 does not allow the use of OMF in, the, in zone 3 even for less important buildings. Also, there is an important philosophy which, when it comes to the design of uh, uh, earthquake resistant structures, which is known as strong column weak beam design philosophy. So, <coughs> this uh, approach is not mandatory for uh, ordinary moment frames, however, it is mandatory for special moment frames. Um, what do we understand by strong column weak beam theory? So, at a joint, the idea is that under the acute loading, the hinges would form, but those hinges should not form in the column. So, like for example, in this frame. At this location, if the hinge has formed in the column, that leads to a complete instability of the structure and then the structure could collapse. However, if these hinges don't form in the column but they form in the beam, then <coughs> that allows a much more uh, ductile and much more stable behavior and allows for a progressive kind of a yielding of the structure. So, in order for this to happen, we have to look at this joint. Let's say this is that uh, center of the joint. And we have beams going in this direction and columns going in this direction. So the combined moment, which is for example in this case, the combined moment of the columns is going in the clockwise direction and combined moment from the beams is going in the anti-clockwise direction. The combination of moments in the beam, <coughs> the moment capacity of the beam, the two beams combined, should be less than the moment capacity of the column. So that since the two are going to balance each other, once the if the beam has a lower capacity, it would fail first and then we have to make sure that it has ductile detailing so that even though it yields first, it does not necessarily leads to a drop in moment demand from here, but it allows for larger deflection in the frame and in return it will absorb some uh, seismic energy. 
So IS 800, for example, uh, gives this provision wherein you are required to calculate the moment capacity of the column at the joint and moment, moment capacities of the beams at the same joint. You add them up and then the ratio of the two should be greater than or equal to 1.2. This is very similar to other international standards that are uh, prevalent. Now, there, there could be some variations in the way this M, PB or MPC are calculated. Sometimes they are calculated including the slenderness effect. Sometimes they are not. The new draft version of the ductile detailing for the ductile detailing of uh, steel structures uh, gives a very stringent requirement. So this also has the same philosophy where in sigma MPC where the sigma MBO uh, should be greater than or equal to 1.8. So this says that the column capacity uh, at a joint should be at least 80% greater than the beam capacity. This in my opinion is very stringent. Uh, we are still yet to get more details on this code. I hope as the time progresses. We will get more details about this code. So essentially what they are doing is here is that they are giving more details <coughs> on how to calculate this sigma MPC and sigma MBO value. So for the calculation of uh, bending moment capacity of the beams, they are adding a factor of 1.1 which is just kind of a, a reserved strength which uh, they are accounting for just in case there is an additional strength. RY corresponds to the difference between the characteristic strength of the material and the expected strength of the material. So a 250 yield strength steel would have a characteristic strength of 250 MPa, but an expected strength could be yield strength could be higher than that. So whatever that value is, the ratio of the two should be used here, and then that is the uh, plastic moment capacity and the yield stress. <coughs> so that would give you the uh, moment capacity of all the beams that are connecting to that joint. Similarly, uh, the another formula is available for the for calculation of the capacity of the columns. So here you may see that this uh, factor of Ry and 1.1 are not used because we want to be conservative and in addition to that the slenderness effect is also included because the, if the slenderness reduces the capacity of the column that effect is included by this factor. Right? So if you have uh, learned how to design slender columns uh, you would have come across this, uh, uh, this expression which actually accounts for the reduction in strength in column because of the slenderness effect. Now, the only issue in my opinion is that 1.8 factor seems, uh, seems too large. Maybe there is a, some, some rational for that. We have to hear more from the committee to understand it fully. <coughs> so, as we have just seen that the code requires, the, the existing code IS-800 requires that the, um, the columns should be stronger by more than 20 percent than the beams. So, columns so moment capacity should be at least 20 percent greater than the beams moment capacity. And that is true even for ordinary moment frame and uh, special moment frame if they are using rigid connections. However, ordinary moment frame allows the use of semi-rigid connections and when it allows for the use of semi-rigid connections, then the <coughs> connection should be um, stronger than 0.5 times the plastic moment capacity of the beam. Whereas in the case of special moment frame, the connection should be uh, always be rigid and it should be at least uh, 1.2 times the plastic moment capacity of the beam. Now, what is the strength of the connection? The strength of the connection is basically corresponding to the strength of the weld and the way the force is transferred to, from the beam to the column. <coughs> there is also a provision of using a reduced beam section uh, and a schematic of such a beam system is shown here. Here you may see that the beam cross section is uniform almost, almost up to the point where it is connected to the column but just before that it is reduced artificially in a very smooth manner and the idea here is that we want to artificially create an area which is which can be uh, designated as the hinge area and then a high moment demand comes it does not produce a failure here but it produces it should produce a large amount of yielding in this region so that the failure can be prevented failure at the connection can be prevented because the fear is that a connection failure which would probably be a weld failure here will be catastrophic whereas if we can move it away from the column it will be more uh, gradual and more uh, manageable because it will be ductor, it will be yielding driven so in such a section if such a cross section is used the connection it is prescribed that the connection should be stronger than 80% of the plastic moment capacity of the unreduced section. So the 
<coughs> taking both of these provisions simultaneously, what it means is that this connection should be 20% or 1.2 times stronger than the reduced cross sections moving capacity. At the same time, it should also be at least 80% or stronger than the at least uh, should be stronger than at least 80% of the moment capacity of the section away from the reduced section, the unreduced section. In order for us to know the moment, rotation capacity of a connection, presently we have to go to an extra F of our IS 800, which gives a very cumbersome process and uh, it would be very, very difficult for a design engineer to actually be able to um, calculate the rotation capacity of any given connection design. Uh, what American standard AIC 358 does is that it prescribes or it uh, provides a list of some pre-qualified special moment resistant frame connections. So some of them are shown here. Uh, some of the diagrams are shown here. So these connections, uh, the diagrams are not giving the entire information. You have to go to this code and find out the different dimensional requirements for uh, these connections. And if you fulfill those dimensional requirements, then you can be assured that this connection will be able to develop or will be you would be able to use it in the special moment resistant frame, meaning that it has the it has adequate uh, rotational capacity. So, for example, if the rotational capacity rotation capacity should be at least 4% or 0 0.04 radian, then these connections, as long as you follow the guidelines of these connections, you would be assured of that much of the rotation capacity. In Indian code right now, we don't have any such uh, provisions and that makes the life of an engineer a bit difficult. Uh, I think IS 800 should also develop some such pre-qualified connections which could be handily used. <coughs> uh, another aspect of a ductile design of a beam column joint is the development of a panel zone. So the panel zone is basically the intersection between the beam and the column. So when we have, let's say we have a column and then we have two beams coming and meeting this column at this region and then these beams wish to or want to rotate in this fashion and let's say the column is held in its position. So this will basically produce a, some kind of a um, shear zone, shear panel zone in this system. And that shear panel zone, this will be a shear panel developing in the column web, which is generally considered to be very ductile in nature because it is governed by shear <coughs> yielding of the uh, column web. However, if the column cross section plasticizes uh, significantly, that can lead to an overall instability. So, there are a couple of requirements in order uh, corresponding to the performance of such shear panels. So, for ordinary moment resistant frames, the shear panel uh, are not then required to be particularly designed and uh, only the continuity plates are required in rigid connections uh, if end, end plate connections are not used. If end plate connections are used, then uh, we can assess the requirement of continuity plates. They are not mandatory. If we are welding the flange directly to the column, flange of the beam directly to the column, then it may be, then it is continuity plates are mandatory in ordinary moment resistant frames. In the spatial moment resistant frames, however, we have to check the behavior of the panel zone, even though it can perform in a, it can deform in a very ductile manner. Um, excessive deformation here can lead to instability of the column itself. Therefore, we should make sure that uh, the panel zone, even though it may plasticize to some extent, it should not undergo shear buckling. So those requirements have to be satisfied. And continuity plates are always required, except in the end plate connections. So a panel zone, when we are designing it, we have to calculate the shear force demand on the panel zone and then we have to design it for that kind of a shear force. So because we want to avoid uh, large panel zone deflections, for two reasons, one, a very large deflection in the panel zone will make the column non-straight and create uh, instability in the column uh, that, that would be very risky for the structure. Plus also because of the large deformations right at the tip of the um, weld here, we can expect cracking to start. And in order to avoid that, we should avoid excessive rotation of the panel. How do we calculate the shear force demand in the panel? So the, uh, the guideline could be straightforward. Basically, we know the moment capacity of each beam on each side of the panel. And we are assuming that this uh, beam is going to yield or plasticize under high, uh, high bending moment demands. So therefore, we know the moment capacity of each of these beams, M1 and M2. Uh, 
what we do is we take this uh, moment capacity and we divide it with the lever arm so that we can get the tension force demand and the compression force demand in the flanges of the beam. So those tension and compression force demands on the flanges of the beam are calculated. Then those two flanges, since both beams would be rotating in the same direction, those flanges would be applying a force on the panel zone in the same direction. So we add these two forces, force coming from the top flange on one beam and force coming from the top flange of the other beam. And then we add them together. In addition to that, from our structural analysis, we would have calculated some shear force demand in the column top. So that shear force demand we deduct because that is the only force that is uh, balancing or that is kind of acting against these two forces. And that will give us the net force acting at the top end of the panel. The same force must be acting at the bottom edge of the panel in order to, re to resist it. So basically that gives us the shear force demand and then we need to take the cross-section area and design for that shear force demand. So this is the expression that I have just explained to you to calculate the shear force demand in the uh, column panel. In addition to these, there is also there are also a couple of other requirements. One such requirement is the use of plastic type of slender cross-sections. So, you might recall that whenever we wanted to avoid local buckling of the cross section, we were required to use a semi compact or compact cross section based on different provisions. We were never using, until we talked about earthquake engineering, uh, we never uh, used plastic cross sections. We never discussed this column. Okay. So, this column is relevant when it comes to earthquake performance of a connection. So, when we are designing a member for uh, which is a part of earthquake resisting frame, if it is near a region where we are not expecting any hinge to form. So, for example, all the FCEs, okay, they can be designed to have a compact class classification. They don't have to be very stringent, compact class uh, cross sections are sufficient. However, in the regions where we are expecting the cross section to undergo plastic deformations, which is basically the DCEs elements, there we cannot have compact, we have to have plastic classification. So you may see that plastic classification is even more stringent, meaning that each plate in a hot roll section, for example, has to be thicker. So B by T ratio is smaller in comparison to compact section. That means the plates have to be thicker. That is basically what it means is that after, uh, a plastic classification ensures that even after a very large rotation or very large strain and that in cyclic conditions, the cross section does not undergo local buckling easily and it can accommodate a lot of compressive and tensile uh, plasticization over and over again. Now we will talk about some of the detailing aspects of uh, rigid connections. So when we want a rigid connection to be ductile, we have to make sure that there are no risks of any fractures or uh, premature fractures to happen in the connection. Wherever we have bolted connections, typically fractures can be controlled and we can avoid the modes in which a sudden fracture can happen. However, welds are relatively um, um, unpredictable in comparison to bolts and uh, the challenges are often um, lie in the workmanship and some of the design provisions or some of the guidelines have been developed to avoid a premature failure or premature fracture of a bolt of a weld. So there are various such uh, considerations which avoid any defect or any kind of a inclusion in the weld which can trigger an early crack in a weld. In, we have to take all those precautions in addition to that you might see that, uh, for example, in this situation, we may be required for, for us to be able to weld or groove weld this bottom flange to the column. We require a backing bar or a backing strip to be placed beneath the flange so that this material can be deposited in that location. Now, the interface between the backing bar and the column flange, which is partially, only partially fused together, that interface becomes the uh, point of stress concentration and that's where the crack can start and many such possible cracks have been documented in the literature and listed here. So this is a different type of a crack which is not starting from there but this is starting only because of some problems with the hydrogen uh, inclusion in the welding process but in most of the other cases you may see that the crack starts from that interface between the backing strip and the um, flange, uh, bottom uh, flange. So in all such situations, we have to be extra careful. Generally, the requirement is that we should uh, back gauge, so we should remove this backing bar after the weld is done and we should provide a smooth surface here. Also, uh, the access hole which needs to be provided so that we can provide a uh, weld, a continuous weld 
through the entire width of the flange. Sometimes we may introduce, the welder may introduce a defect or a sharp corner here that may give rise to the possibility of uh, fracture in the bottom flange and even that surface and even the geometry of this access hole is very strictly um, has to be adhered to so that there is a, there are no sharp surfaces or not, no sharp corners in the entire geometry in order for us to be able to avoid uh, such fractures. So with this slide I am concluding this course um, I was uh, I was able to cover topics such as basics of uh, welding and bolt connections, then uh, the design of uh, bolt groups and weld groups, then designing of frame members which are non-ductile detailed and then some uh, guiding principles for the design of ductile connections. Now the handicap here is that in the Indian code there are no detailed guidelines for the designing and detailing of ductile connections yet. One code is under development so soon it will be published and then we would have more uh, strict and more uh, uniform uh, guidelines for such connections. Uh, until then, we would have to follow some of the international standards or the basic principles, uh, fundamental principles to design uh, ductile connections or ductile frames. So, uh, I am thankful for all the audience, for all the participants in the course. Uh, I look forward to offering this course again. This is where I will conclude. Thank you.